Um, we're going to talk this morning <clears throat> about understanding Scripture. And <clears throat> if we're going to understand Scripture, which I think is the goal of everyone here, I think that's why you're here, you want to understand the Scripture, we have to have some understanding of the principle of hermeneutics, which is the science of biblical interpretation. And a principle that is vital to proper interpretation of Scripture is the principle of audience relevance. Now this means that whatever a passage meant, or whatever word spoken in Scripture meant, it meant or had direct application to the original intended audience. And I think this is vital. If you get this, it's going to make a huge difference in the way you read Scripture. Because so many people read it like it's a newspaper. It came today, and when it says soon, they think, yeah, soon. Well, that soon was 2,000 years ago, so maybe it doesn't have application to you. But that's what we have to try to figure out. Now, under the principle of audience relevance, something that is very important for us to understand is the transformation of the ages. Or we could say, we need to understand, when did the Old Covenant end? When was the New Covenant consummated? Now, to illustrate the necessity of understanding the two ages and when they changed, let's look at Mark 10, verse 29 and 30. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses, house or brothers, or sister or mother or father or children or farms, for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now I want you to pay particular attention to the last phrase there, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says that they'll receive eternal life in the age to come. Do they not have eternal life? Do we not have eternal life? Is it something yet future? Well, commenting on in the age to come eternal life, Sweet says, the age which is to follow the parousia, the second coming. So according to Sweet, eternal life is not available until after the parousia. And I agree with him. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says... In this present age, and it says the time period between Jesus' first and second advents, I agree with that, that's the present age. Then, in the age to come, the future age following Jesus' return, and I agree again. So what the Bible Knowledge Commentary is saying is that we still don't have eternal life, because they believe we are still in the present age, not the age to come. So eternal life's not available until after the second coming. So I guess we have to ask, do we have eternal life? Wiest, in his word studies, says this, and I love what Wiest says. The authorities are silent on all this. And the present writer confesses that he is at a loss to suggest an interpretation. The best he can do is offer the usage of the Greek words in question. I love his honesty. He admits... He says, I, I, I'm just at a loss to give you an interpretation of what this means. As is obvious, the phrase is troubling to a lot of people. Well, to understand what Jesus is saying, we need to understand that all through the New Testament we see two ages in contrast. This age and the age to come. We see this in our text. He talks about now in the present age, and then he says in the age to come. So there's a present age, there's an age to come. Two separate ages. We see this contrast also in uh, Matthew 12, 32. It says, and whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Two different ages. Now, the word come here at the end of the verse is the Greek word mellow. We just talked about this recently, which means about to be. We could translate this the age about to come. Now, again, we have to ask about to come for who? For us? No, because we're not the original audience. 
We're not the ones being talked to here. It was a first century audience that the age was about to come. It was about to come to the people that Jesus was speaking to. Look at Ephesians 1.21. He says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Here again we see two ages. The New Testament speaks of two ages. This age and the age to come. And understanding these two ages and when they changed, listen to me, is fundamental to interpreting Scripture. If you're understanding things in the wrong age, you're going to get all out of whack as far as what the Scripture is trying to teach. The New Testament writers lived in the age that they called this age. To the New Testament writers, the age to come was future, but it was very near because the age they lived in was about to end. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says, Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, as a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of, he said, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. When Paul wrote this in the first century, he says the age and the wisdom of the age, the rulers of the age is passing away. But we speak of God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So the wisdom and rulers of this age were passing away because the age was passing away. He speaks of the Jewish leaders and the old covenant system. He says the rulers of this age have crucified the Lord of glory. And the rulers would shortly have no realm in which to rule because the age was about to end. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. Paul says the end of the ages have come upon us. Not us, but the, us in the first century. This age, along with its wisdom and its rulers, so it is about to end here. Now, we've established the existence, I think, of two ages. This age and the age to come. Clearly, the Bible says that. I don't think anybody can argue with that. The thing we need to understand is, when did the age change? See, because many say it hasn't yet. They're looking for a change. And what we need to understand, if we're going to understand Scripture, is that the ages didn't change at a point in time, but there was a 40-year period of transition. Watch it. 40 years in this change. The, this age extended all the way through to the end of the 40-year period. And this 40-year period is known as the transition period. It's known as the Christ event. And I'll explain that in a minute here. And it's known as the second exodus. So when did the transition period or the Christ event or the second exodus began? Well, to answer that, I think you need to understand when the Old Covenant began. Do you know when the Old Covenant began? Well, it was in the third month after the Jews left Egypt. They arrived in the Sinai Desert, and they camped opposite Mount Sinai. Moses was then told by God to gather the Israelites together to receive the law. The Israelites stood at the, fount, at the foot of Mount Sinai in great awe. And Moses went up alone on the mountain, and as he neared the top, a mighty voice announced the Ten Commandments. Now, no date is actually associated with this in the Bible. But you ask any observant Jewish person, and they will connect the giving of the Ten Commandments with the first Shavuot. Now, that First Testament feast, Shavuot, is better known to us as Pentecost. Pentecost. The Shavuot, or Pentecost, is the season, called by the Jews, of the giving of the Torah. 
Because this is literally the day that God revealed himself to the people of Israel as they stood at the base of the mountain. And in giving the law, God established the nation Israel as his covenant people. He gave them a law. He entered into a covenant with them. Now, here's what we have to understand. Shavuot, Pentecost, is a type. The anti-type being the New Testament, Pentecost. So the law was given on Pentecost, the new law. The New Testament, the new covenant, was given also on Pentecost. On this day, believers became the first fruit members of the new church. God's church, the church of Jesus Christ. And Christian scholars mark that historic Pentecost in Jerusalem as the spiritual birthday of the church. So he entered into a covenant with Israel on Shavuot, Pentecost. He enters into a covenant with the church the same day. This is the anti-type. This was the beginning of the new covenant, the second exodus. Started at Pentecost, went to A.D. 70. Now the old covenant was established after a 40-year transition time. From Egypt to the promised land. The Passover deliverance wasn't consummated until they entered the promised land, which was 40 years. A 40-year period of transition. Again, that is a type. The anti-type being seen in the New Testament. And we're all familiar with that first Exodus period. Israel, after the flesh, is removed from the bondage of Egypt at Passover. They're put in the wilderness on a physical journey to a physical promised land. But the more important, the anti-type, is the spiritual Exodus. And Isaiah talks about this. This Exodus runs from Pentecost, the birth of the church, to AD 70, 40 years later. And in this exodus, Israel, after the Spirit, left its bondage to the law of sin and death and begins a 40-year spiritual journey to the spiritual inheritance, the kingdom of God, the new heavens and new earth. Now, we could compare this with the transition period of changing presidents. In November, in our nation, a president is elected. The one in power becomes now the old administration. It becomes provisional after the election results are known. Yet he is still in power. The old president is still commander-in-chief. This time could be referred to as the last days of that administration. Beginning at the election and ending at the swearing in. See, it's not a new administration yet. But notable changes are taking place that mark its end. The president-elect is assuming more and more power as the parties transition the government into the new administration. The old administration confers with the new administration before making decisions that affect the administration. And then the president-elect assumes full power after he swears in as president. Until then, he cannot change any laws or make any agreements on behalf of the U.S. that can be enacted until his inauguration. So it's a transition time. That's what we see here. Now let's look at the transition that took place during the New Testament. And I think that if we understand that when we trust Christ, you and I, we receive his righteousness. Hopefully you understand that. We go over that all the time. As Christians, we are as righteous as Jesus Christ. Only two choices. You either have his righteousness or you have yours. And if you have yours, you're damned. If you have his, you're saved. We stand complete in him. Now, knowing this, that we have the righteousness of Christ, we are complete before him, this statement of Paul can be very confusing in Philippians 3.12. Paul says, not that I have already attained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. What was it that Paul had not yet attained? Well, the Greek word used here for attain is lambano. It means to receive, to grasp, to seize, to acquire. Paul's saying, I don't have it yet. What is it that he doesn't have? Well, the verb lambano is transitive, but the object is not expressed. Is it the resurrection that he mentioned in verse 11 that he has not attained? Yes, I think the resurrection is included, but it's more than that. See, verses 4 through 11 are a unit speaking of righteousness. The key verse being verse 9. And may be found in him, Paul says, I want to be found in Christ. This is my goal. This is what I'm shooting for. Not having a righteousness of my own, 
derived from the law. Why? Because Paul knows that is damning. I can't have a righteous by the law. But here's what I want. That which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I think that Paul is saying he did not yet have the righteousness of Christ. Christ's righteousness had not yet been given to the saints. Now, that might not fit your theology, but I think it fits the context of what Paul is talking about. He says, or have I already become perfect? Now, that would mean that Paul's saying that he had not yet been made righteous. Now, hang on with me for a minute. Paul had been declared righteous. That is justification. Justification may be defined as the act of God whereby he declares righteous him who believes in Christ. Declares righteous. You and I aren't declared righteous. We are righteous. There's a difference. See, they hadn't been made righteous yet because Christ had not returned. So they were declared righteous. That's justification. We're not. We are righteous. We have the very righteousness of Christ. It is not a declaration on the part of God. It is an act on the part of God. He has placed us in the body of Christ and made us righteous. But to Paul and the first century saints, it was a declaration. To us, it's a reality. Jesus Christ took our sin. He bore the penalty of the cross and he gives us his righteousness. You and I are not declared righteous. We are righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But we, we now have become the righteousness of God in him. We have been made righteous by God for all eternity. It will never be reversed. It will never be changed. Today all believers have Christ's righteousness. We are in Him. All that Christ is and has, we are and have because we are part of His body. And as you study the Scriptures, you're going to find there are two bodies. The body of Adam, the body of Christ. And when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you make that transition from death, the body of Adam, to life, the body of Christ. Now, at the time of Paul's writing, and Paul wrote all his material in this period. Matter of fact, listen, all the New Testament writers wrote all their material in the transition period. Nothing was written after A.D. 70. Now, I know there's a lot of people today that are going to disagree with that. Uh, most people say the book of Revelation was written in 96. That is ridiculous. I mean, I mean it is ridiculous if you study the facts. All right, uh, Ken Gentry has a book out called Before Jerusalem Fell, The Dating of the Book of Revelation. It's about that thick. It's 400 and some pages on the dating of Revelation. I read it, okay? It's a good book, but he basically says this 96 AD date has no internal evidence or external evidence. The evidence internally, which is the strongest evidence, is definitely for prior to AD 70. I mean, you go to Revelation 11, and he tells them, take this and measure the temple. If it's 96, there is no temple. The temple's gone. It's destroyed. So the evidence is strong that it was prior to that. And I had a good friend who recently passed away, Zane Hodges. He was on the translation committee for the new King James Version. And he told me that all the translators on that committee believed that all of Scripture was written prior to A.D. 70. They're not preterists. They're dispensationalists for the most part. But they believed it was all written prior to A.D. 70. So all the writers wrote in this transition period. And that's why we have to understand they're writing in this age. We're living in a different age. Now, you might ask, didn't Paul and the New Testament saints already have the righteousness of God? Well, yes and no. They were, like I said, they were declared righteous, but they're waiting to be made righteous. The futuristic perspective of God's righteousness was clearly expressed by Paul in Galatians 5.5. He said, for we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting, waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now, if righteousness was already a fulfilled, completed event, 
Paul made a big mistake in making righteousness by faith a matter of hope. You know what? You don't hope for what you have. We understand that, right? That's pretty simple. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that. Romans 8, 24. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So if righteousness was a present reality, why would Paul hope for it? But Paul also talks as though it was a present possession. For example, he says in Romans 4, 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Did Paul have Christ's righteousness, or was it still future to him? Well, he had been declared righteous by God. But he was waiting, he was declared righteous, based on the fact that Christ would return and make him righteous. Paul lived in what the Bible called the last days. Now, what exactly are the last days? Another important concept that we need to understand. When did the last days start? When did they end? See, these are very important questions that must be answered if we're going to interpret the Bible correctly. And again, most people today believe we're living in the last days. Look at Hebrews 1-2. You can identify when the last days starts. All right? In these last days, the writer of Hebrew was in the last days, he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. So if Jesus is speaking, Jesus is here, he's in the last days. The writer of Hebrews says that they, the first century Christians, were living in the last days. Now most Christians would agree that the last days began around the time of Christ. Let's say they began with the ministry of Christ. All right? <clears throat> Just prior to <clears throat> Pentecost. The big debate comes over, when do they end? Most people have a question mark. They think we're still in them. The last days are still going on. They'd probably say, most Christians would probably say that 21st century American Christians are living in the last days. That's a very commonly held view. There are many today who believe that we're in the last days. And, you know, and the reason they believe that is everything in the world. Oh, there's turmoil in the Middle East. Oh, there's technological advancements. There's immorality. Oh, the signs of the times. Oh, my word. Everything that happens is a sign of the time. And if you ever watch Jack Van Impey, oh, my word, he's all excited because everything in the newspaper, oh, look, Roxella, you know, and uh, the, Jesus is coming soon, you know, and he's all pumped up. A lot of Jews are going to be destroyed, and he's excited about it, you know? <clears throat> John MacArthur writes this. Now, I'll tell you something very simple. Put it in your theological file. You're living in the last days. Everybody's been living in the last days since Jesus arrived to minister. I don't agree that we're in the last days, but I do agree when they began. He says they began when Jesus arrived. He goes on to say, the Jewish last days began 2,000 years ago. Did you know that? That's right. The Jewish last days began 2,000 years ago with the arrival of Messiah. Like I said, I agree with that. They will be completed when the setting up of the kingdom takes place. <clears throat> I agree with that too, but we just disagree on when that will take place. It just so happens that the last days has stretched at least 2,000 years. Now notice that he calls it the Jewish last days. I agree with that. But he says they've lasted for 2,000 years. At the time of the New Testament Pentecost, at the time when he says the last days began... Israel had been in existence for 1,600 years. So, here we got Israel, 1,600 years. Then their last days start. Well, their last days are way longer than any of their days. So how is that the last days? You know, last days are usually the very end of something. Not, you know, 2,000 years of last days. We got more last days than we had any days. That doesn't make any sense at all. The last days were the last days, listen, of the old covenant, of Judaism. Those last days began around Pentecost. They ended in AD 70 when the Jewish temple was destroyed. So we can back that arrow up. We know when the last days ended, AD 70. That temple coming down was a sign from God that's over. 
We now live in what the Bible calls the age to come, which is the New Covenant age. And this 40-year period from Pentecost to Holocaust was a time of transition from the Old to the New Covenant. And, and I, you see that here, the, the age to come, the New Covenant is represented in the blue. And it begins at Pentecost, very small. Ezekiel 47 says there's a trickle of water coming out of the temple. But you go a thousand furlongs and it's to your ankle. You go another thousand, it's to your knees and it's to your waist and then it's a huge river. And everything the river touches lives. Because it's just getting more and more as it goes on. And the, new, the old covenant you see is diminishing. It is growing old, Hebrews 8.13 says, ready to vanish. So we see in this transition, the new's growing, the old is fading. The new covenant had been inaugurated, but not yet consummated. It was a time of already, but not yet. Back to Galatians 5.5. 5. He says, for we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now the words translated here, are waiting, are the Greek word apekdekomai. And the composite word speaks of an attitude of intense yearning and eager waiting. This Greek word is only used seven times in the New Testament. And every one of them is a reference to the second coming. Thus righteousness comes at the second coming. Apek decamai is used three times in Romans 8. It's used in verse 19, 23, and 25. And the context of these verses of Romans 8 is that of the second coming. Redemption, people, is tied to the second coming. And remember, this is where we started in Mark. Eternal life's in the age to come. Redemption's tied to the second coming. It hasn't quite come yet to these people. Okay. Luke 21, 27. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. This is a reference to the second coming. With power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Now, the, these things in this verse, in the context, if you go back and look at the context, it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem is destroyed, the redemption is received. He says, your redemption's drawing nigh when you see this stuff start to happen. This literal three and a half year siege of Jerusalem. The army surrounded it. Three and a half years later, the city fell. All right, we've seen that redemption is tied to the second coming. Now, let's get back to our word, apekdekamai. We see it in 1 Corinthians 1.7. So that you are not lacking in any gift, eagerly awaiting, apekdekamai, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we said that this Greek word is only used seven times in the New Testament. Every one of them is in reference to the second coming. We see it in Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await, apekdekamai, for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They're waiting for the second coming. We see it in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await apekdekamai him. Now notice in these verses in Hebrews that when Christ appears the second time, it is for salvation. So righteousness that the Galatians eagerly awaited was to come to them at the parousia of Jesus Christ, at his second coming. Salvation was not a completed event in the lives of the first century believers. It was a hope. They looked forward to its soon arrival. Look at Romans 13, 11 through 12. And this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Why? For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. Well, I thought we got it when we believed. No, but it's near now. Verse 12 says, The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, he equates their salvation here with the day. The day is at hand. What is the day? The day is referring to the new covenant. The new covenant is light. 
The old covenant is what? Darkness. The night's almost gone. The old covenant, it's almost over, people. And the day is dawning. It's at hand. Peter also states that their salvation was not yet complete in 1 Peter 1.5. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It was ready to be revealed in the last time, which would happen at the return of Christ. He says in 1.7, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold that, perish, that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now the incompleteness of believers during that transition period from 30 to 70 A.D. doesn't contradict Paul's affirmation when he says in Colossians 2.10, you're complete in him. Because the certain completeness of Christ's work was the basis and confidence of the transformation already at work. With the future fullness drawing near. Speaking of Jesus, Peter says this, 1 Peter 1.20. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in the last days, times, in these last times, for the sake of you. Jesus appeared in the last times. Now, Jesus came during the last times. It was the last times of this age. It's this age that ran from up to A.D. 70. That was the old covenant age. It was the Jewish age. That age ended with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. So the New Testament writers lived in what the Bible calls this age. That's where the New Testament writers were. Now this age of the Bible is the age of the old covenant that was about to pass away in the first century. It should be clear to you, I think, that this age is not the Christian age in which we live. In the first century, the age of the old covenant was fading away. It would end completely, as I said, when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Look at uh, Hebrews 8.13. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming, here's the process, it's becoming obsolete, it is growing old, and is getting ready to disappear. Now, the author of Hebrews, Hebrews was written about 64 to 67 A.D. At this time, the Old Covenant is still in effect, but only for a couple more years. It is ready, he says, to pass away. It passed away in AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem. So here, this is on the other side of our 40-year period. This AD 70 marks the other side. And the Old Covenant terminated at AD 7. That was the end of it, which was the second coming of Christ. We live in the New Covenant. That's the age that we are in. It's the, this age of the Bible, which is over here, is now ancient history. This 40-year transition period is also known as the Christ event. Now, this is important, and I want you to try to grab this if you can, because this will really be helpful, because we think of the coming of Christ as, well, he came, and then he went away, and then comes again, and we think of them as distinct and separate things. They are not. In prophecy, in Scripture, they are talked about as an event. The coming, the second coming, it all fits in together in this 40-year period. <clears throat> For example, in Acts 2.1, it says, When the day of Pentecost was come, they were all together in one place. Now, we're all aware of what happened to Pentecost. We've been going through this in the book of Acts. This is the birth of the church. The people who were there experienced it, and they wondered, what did it mean? And we see that in Acts 2.12. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? What's going on here? But others were mocking and saying, ah, they're full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. That's Peter's interpretation of what's happening. They're looking at it and they say, what does this mean? And Peter says, hey, this is Joel's prophecy being fulfilled. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that Pentecost is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Then he quotes from Joel 2.28 through 32. 
And it shall be in the last day. So this is, we know the Pentecost happened in the last days. I'll pour forth my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. The last days. So if Pentecost is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, then Pentecost happened in the last days. You'd agree that was the last day started there. Now, the idea of the last days is that they are times of Messiah. Listen, encompassing both his humble coming and his return in glory. In those days, he says, I will pour out my spirit. This is Pentecost. I don't, no one will disagree with that. The spirit's poured out, but watch, the prophecy doesn't stop there. Joel goes on, and he says, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapor of smoke. We went from Pentecost, people, to Holocaust, judgment. Watch verse 20. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please notice that it's one prophecy of one event that encompasses both the pouring out of the Spirit and judgment so joel gives us a prophecy of the christ event the christ event encompasses the cross pentecost the resurrection the judgment and the parousia notice that joel's prophecy covers from pentecost to the day of the lord it covers a 40-year period that was equal to a generation that's what joel's talking about that whole period started at pentecost ends with judgment now, we remember in Matthew 24, 34, Jesus, in dealing with this, 24 is all about eschatology. He says, I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. Now, this generation was the generation that he spoke to. And here, he very plainly and clearly tells his disciples that all the things he just talked about were going to come to pass in their generation. Now, this includes, if you read back in the text, the gospel being preached in all the world, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, the coming of the Son of Man. And notice also verse uh, 29. He says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky. That's what Joel talked about. And Jesus said it would all be fulfilled in a generation. And guess what? Joel's prophecy from beginning to end covered a generation, a 40-year period. Biblically, a generation was 40 years. And this is what's known as the transition period or the Christ event or the second exodus. It's a time of transition from the old covenant to the new. So Joel's prophecy covered a 40-year period. And this 40-year period is the Christ event. Now we see the same idea, the idea of an event that takes place over a period of time in Matthew. Matthew 3, 1 and 2 says, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, at hand here is used later in the gospel as Jesus is drawing near to Jerusalem. He's at hand. It indicates something that's on the verge of coming. It's close. John is telling them they need to repent because the kingdom is very close. The kingdom which Messiah will set up. Now, what I want you to see this morning is that John's message also covered a 40-year period. John announced in verse 2 that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, meaning it was very near, that's a reference to Pentecost. But John's message also involved judgment. Look down in the text a little to 3.10. John says the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's judgment. So John talks about this coming kingdom that began at Pentecost. He talks about judgment. Now, in order for the kingdom to be consummated, which would happen after 40 years, there had to be a time of judgment. See, the axe laid to the root. It's ready to cut down the tree that's not bearing good fruit. And John places an emphasis on fire again in verses 11 and 12. In those verses, there's a reference to coming destruction. Now, the Jews of John's day knew these prophecies of Hebrew Scripture. They understood that before the kingdom could be consummated, God's judgment would fall on the unbelievers who would be rooted out of the kingdom of Messiah so his rule could be established. Look at Matthew 3.11. John is saying, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. 
But he who is coming after me, that's Christ, is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, that's Pentecost, and with fire, that's Holocaust. So here John refers to the Christ event. It begins at Pentecost with the baptism of the Spirit. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We know that happened at Pentecost. And he says he's going to baptize you with fire. And that happened at AD 70. The fire of judgment. Now notice what Jesus told the Jewish leaders of his day. This is in Mark chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. He says, And he began to speak to them a parable. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower. What is that a reference to? Israel, Isaiah chapter 5. Israel is God's vineyard. All right? That's where he's quoting from. And he rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. And at the harvest time, he sent the slaves to, to the, his slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. What was the produce that God wanted? Righteousness. Justice, Isaiah 5. That's what God was looking for. That's the produce. Guess what? There wasn't any. Okay? And they took him, this is the slave, and they beat him. This is the prophet. God sends his prophets. They beat the prophets. They sent him away empty-handed. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, on and on and on. And he sent them another slave, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. He sent another, and the one they killed, and with many others, beating some, killing others. That's how they treated the prophets. And he had one more to send, a beloved son. You got the picture, right? He sent him last of all saying, they're going to respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus is talking to the leaders of that day. Listen, he says, He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Boy, that had to be poignant to those Jewish leaders who were hearing this story. He knew, they knew exactly what he was talking about. They took him and they killed him. And he's going to destroy those vine growers. Jesus is saying that he is the Son of God. He comes in God's authority. They're going to kill him. And that God will not only destroy them, but he will give the leadership to the Gentiles. Now, historically, how did God destroy the vine growers? Well, 40 years later, God used the Roman armies to come in, surround the city of Jerusalem, and after three and a half years, destroy it. And you know, Jesus said, there will one stone not be left upon another. That's, that's a pretty specific prophecy. I mean, here's this huge, huge fortress that's made of these massive marble stones. And he said, there won't be a stone left on another. Why would you do that? You go in, you capture the city, you destroy as much as you have to. And why would you turn the whole thing upside down? Well, see, when the fires of the city was being destroyed, all the gold in that temple melted down into the cracks in between the, the rocks. And so the Roman army literally tore up all the stones of the temple to get the gold out of it. Not one stone was left upon another. The chief priests, the scribes, many Jews were, were slain. Many more were taken off into captivity and dispersed among the nations. And God did exactly what he said he was going to do in that parable. Matthew says he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. That's Pentecost to Holocaust. The outpouring of the Spirit and the outpouring of judgment on Israel. The Spirit had been poured out and within 40 years judgment would fall on all who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is this period called the transition period and the Christ event, but it's also called the second exodus. How long did Israel's exodus out of Egypt take? Forty years, right? And exodus, this exodus, that physical exodus of Israel was a type of a much more important exodus to come. Look at Luke 9, 29-31. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And he behold, and behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They're speaking about the departure of Jesus. Now, Moses and Elijah appear in glory, and they're speaking about this departure. The word for departure here is the Greek word exodus. 
There's the start in Exodus at the beginning of the cross. And start another 40-year journey. In this Exodus, Israel, after the Spirit, left its bondage to the law of sin and death and begins a 40-year spiritual journey to its inheritance. The kingdom of God, the new heavens, the new earth, wherein righteousness dwells. So when did the age change? Well, in order to understand it, we need to understand we need to understand when the age changed if we're going to understand Scripture. We really do, or we're going to be so confused on so many passages. It didn't happen at a point in time. It was a transition. And this age lasted for 40 years until A.D. 70. And then it came to a conclusion. It began at Pentecost, ended with the destruction of Jerusalem at the second coming of Christ. The transition period was the last days. Not the last days of the world, the last days of old covenant Israel. The new covenant was gaining power, awaiting the appointed day when it would assume full power. Now after AD 70, the old covenant terminates. As we said that, the old covenant terminates at AD 70, that's the second coming. It ends there. We live over here in the new covenant. And we should be saying amen to that. The Bible calls this new covenant the age to come. Because to the first century saints, it was future. We're 2,000 years later. It's not future to us. After AD 70, the, everyone lived in the age to come. This age is also called the new heaven and new earth. Isaiah 65 and 66, Revelation 21 and 22. It is called the new Jerusalem. In Galatians 4. He makes a comparison in Galatians 4, which is a very critical text, I think. And you read Galatians 4, he talks about the new covenant and the old covenant. He talks about the Jerusalem from above and the Jerusalem that now is. So he compares the two Jerusalems and he says they're two covenants. So the new Jerusalem is the new covenant. It is Zion. It is the everlasting covenant. Believers, we're no longer in the transition period. We are living in the new covenant age in which righteousness dwells. We're not living in the age of hope. This over here was an age of hope. They were hoping for things, waiting for it. They hadn't quite got it yet. They knew they were going to get it, and they're waiting. They're hoping. We live in the age of, you ready for this? Have. We're not hoping. And that's what I've been trying to tell you. Listen, believers, you have everything right now that you're ever going to get in Christ. You have it all. You're in his body. You received his righteousness. You're one with him. There's nothing more for you to get. We don't look forward to anything. You say, well, I can't wait till I get this. You're not going to get anything. You know what you're going to do is you're going to lose something. You know what? Your body. And that's what it is. When we move to heaven, we drop the physical coil, this biological body, we move into the realm of God. I can't tell you anything more about it. I don't know what it's like to be without a body. Never been in that state. But I imagine it's going to be pretty incredible. You know, it's going to be so incredible that the Bible hardly ever talks about it. It really doesn't. It doesn't tell us anything about heaven. Very, very little about heaven. Because I don't think our mind can grasp it. It's the realm of God. It's a different realm. We're not going to get something. We're going to lose the body. Now, that's going to be a change, I admit. There's, there's a change going to take place there because, you know, we, we've always dwelt in a body. You don't know what it's like to live outside of it. But right now, this is the, the important thing you understand. You're complete in Christ. You have everything. You possess the righteousness of Christ. You are loved unconditionally by God because you are in Christ. He loves you like he loves his son because you are in his son. Again, two bodies. Body of Adam, body of Christ, the last Adam. Christ came and fulfilled what Adam failed to do. He provided a perfect righteousness. Obeyed the law completely, died a substitutionary death on our behalf, and we rest in him. Man, it's a, it's a privileged, privileged position that we have, people. And here's why I think this is important. First of all, I think it's very important. If you're going to understand scripture, you have to understand this changing of the ages. But I also think it's very important. Because I think it's very sad for people to hope for something they already have. Oh, I can't wait till I get this. And I used to be there. You know, I used to read Revelation chapter 21, and, you know, God's going to dwell with his people. I thought, boy, that's going to be sweet. (laughs) 
I'm waiting for what I have. He dwells with me now. I'm in his presence right now. I'm in a face-to-face relationship with God right now. can talk to him anytime I want, about anything I want. Now. No longer a separation as Israel had with the veil, reminding them their sin kept them from God. My sin is gone. I come to God, God, I'm sorry about that sin. He said, what sin? You're righteous in Christ Jesus. What a privileged position. And I believe that this position should motivate us to live a holy, righteous life before God, to honor him in all that we do. And let me close with this. And I've used this study before, but I think it's important. In an educational study, in this study, they, pe- they gave people a new concept. Pick a new concept, whatever, to say the earth is round. To some people, that was a new concept. Or say the second coming already happened. That's a new concept to a lot of people, right? They gave them a new concept. And they asked them to believe it. Okay, here's some new facts. I want you to believe these. And if they believed them, it resulted in them setting aside some things they already believed. It, it resulted in a paradigm shift. I've got to give up what I used to think because now I think this. And here's what the study found. 50% of the people believed it immediately. They took these new facts and they said, yep, they didn't think about it. They said, oh, that sounds good, I'll believe it. Kind of an emotional decision. 30% didn't believe it to me. They said, I don't like that, I'm not believing it. They didn't think about it either. 15% waited. They wanted to wait for a while while they made up their minds. But they didn't ask for any clarification. They didn't ask for any further information. Just give me some time to think about it. 5% analyzed all the details and finally came to a conclusion. So the results of the study go like this. You ready? It is estimated that 5% of the people think. I have no problem with that. I don't, <laughs> you know, knowing people, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think that maybe is a high number, okay? 15% of the people think they think. You know those people, well, I think I think because I think I do. And 80% of the people would rather die than think. And that's most people. I don't want any facts. Don't tell me that. No, I don't believe. Just let me keep my head in the sand. I know what I believe. Don't confuse me with the facts. That kind of thing. They'd rather die than they're just not going to think. And I think we see that in our society. We're not a thinking society anymore. We have definitely changed. I think that the Bereans in Acts 17 that we recently studied were among the five percenters. Okay? They analyzed, they thought, they took it in, and that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to believe this. I'm asking you to study this, to look at the scriptures, to go over, to compare scripture with scripture, and find out if it's so. I've never asked you to believe anything I said because I said it. I know I'm fallible. I know I'm human. I know I am wrong. I just don't know where. If I knew, I would change and not be wrong. Okay? But I'm telling you, take the scriptures and examine them and decide for yourself. That's all that matters. You don't have to believe what I believe, but you do have to go to the Scriptures and have some conclusion that you came to on your own from looking at what the Bible has to say. And I'm saying that this drastically changes the way we look at a lot of things. When we understand the age has changed, we understand that soon doesn't mean soon to us. At hand doesn't mean at hand to us. This generation doesn't mean our generation. We understand all those things. We understand Christ came and his coming wasn't some physical cataclysmic event that rocked the world. His coming was a changing of covenants to bring man back what man had lost. What did he lose? Remember in the Garden of Eden, man was separated from the Garden of Eden. A flaming sword was put there so he couldn't get back to the tree of life. What do you find in the book of Revelation? The tree of life. Because now man has access into the presence of God. And that tree of life represented the presence of God. Now man, by, because of Christ, is brought back into the presence of God. The Bible is all about that spiritual reality. Man dying a, fit, a spiritual death because of sin. Jesus Christ coming, bringing man back into God's presence. Bringing back eternal life. That's what it's all about. Let's pray.